Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Energy 101. Today, we have Andrew here from Forecast. He is the Chief Technology Officer. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry? Yeah, of course. Um, so my background um, is a geophysicist. So I went to Texas A&M for my undergraduate uh, in geophysics, and then I went to Colorado School of Mines for graduate school. Oh. And that's oh. a standard for most geoscientists in the industry who want to work as um, a geologist or geophysicist, they have to go get a master's or a PhD. Mm -hmm. And so um, coming out of that, I um, went to work at uh, Newfield Exploration, and I've spent most of my time there doing uh, ex on exploration teams and on operations teams. And I was there for close to a decade. And then I left there to go to Inside Natural Resources, and I was the geophysicist for them for um, about three and a half years until we sold uh, the company to exited to Marathon. Mm -hmm. And then about um, it's almost six months now, uh, I started as um, working with um, Zach Coplin on mm -hmm. on uh, forecast, and um, was the took over development of the software, and now that's what I do. So. Can you give yeah. us a lowdown on what the software is? Yeah, because. so um, ironically enough, it's not necessarily geoscience related, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a, a lot of data science experience that I picked up mm -hmm. from uh, my work at as an operator. And so um, what the software does, it's basically a, a full suite um, economics and reservoir valuation tool. So if you need to know how much an oil and gas project or a set of oil and gas wells are worth, or maybe even a future project's worth, mm -hmm. Um, our software provides the data, provides the tools, and it provides all of the um, you know built-in expertise that you need to create that evaluation and come up with a, a number. Um, and so what we've done is we've streamlined the whole process to where almost anybody can pick it up. You don't have to be a reservoir engineer. You don't have mm -hmm. to be somebody who has you know a deep knowledge of how to build these um, valuations. And so we have a number of clients who are uh, not non-technical. Uh, he use it all the time to make deals. And mm -hmm. so we're really proud of that. And we try to keep it very simple. Um, and there's a lot of really powerful tools in there that we can help um, with analysis and, and, and forecasting. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, so going back to the basics, can you give us the lowdown on what is geology? Yeah. So geology, um, in my opinion, is the most important field in oil and gas because what you're doing in oil and gas is getting oil from rocks. Right. Mm -hmm. So the rocks are where it starts and the rocks are what you really have to understand. And so geology, you know, being a, an earth science discipline um, in oil and gas specifically is, is studying the rocks where oil come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we are um, trained and we learn how to uh, predict and measure the different uh, the rocks that are contained miles into the ground. Um, and there's lots of there's lots of ways of doing that, but a day-to-day -day geologist at an oil and gas company will look at um, measurements that we take from from the wells mm -hmm. uh, that we drilled, and those are called well logs. Um, and a geophysicist like myself will look at um, seismic data, which I, I, I'm sure you guys have at least maybe heard of, but it's basically yeah. a, a way to create a three-dimensional picture, think of like a sonogram. Mm -hmm. uh, or ultrasound or uh, um, x-ray, uh, create a three-dimensional picture of the earth, um, put it together, and then interpret it for where rocks and oil and, and, and where they are on the subsurface, what they look like, what are the characteristics of them. Um, and those are the, the typical duties of, of a you know, geologist, geophysicist, is what we try to, try to do each day. So mm -hmm. is a geophysicist usually on-site or... Like, would you go like, okay, you're offshore. Did yeah. they go offshore? I mean, for fun. I, I, or for, fun. <laughs> for, for, for like to, to check out the, the well site, right? But I would say it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary. Although there is a subset of geologists in the, in the industry that are called mug loggers. And they are on site mm -hmm. just as much as anybody else, anybody else on the rig is. So the mud loggers are geologists who are uh, picking samples from the well. So those are they're drilling and cutting into the ground. They're getting mm -hmm. rock samples back and they look at the rock samples and they just do that continuously throughout the drilling operation. And they're really important for 
locating where we are in depth for check having a person to check on site mm -hmm. um what's happening in the well and those are guys that we um check in with quite a bit and use hmm. so what type of rock i guess are you looking for I yeah like no that's a great question and and you know it it's um traditionally in oil and gas um, you can think of the rocks that we looked for as um, almost like sponges, mm -hmm. right? Where they can take a lot, they can absorb a lot, they have a lot of uh, pores, they have a lot of space in between them. And those are what we call conventionals, right? And, and those are typically made of sandstone. So imagine like all the beach sand compressed into a, to a really tight rock. Mm -hmm. um, and those have enough pore space to just host oil that migrates to them. So when I, I'll tell you about the where that oil comes from, but way down on the subsurface when the oil is formed, um, it it creates pressure mm -hmm. um, that's greater than just the pressure of being buried, and then so it wants to escape. You know, naturally, it's trying to find the surface because it's like, oh, this is a lot of pressure, and let me see if I can get out of the rock. Mm -hmm. And so it finds pathways in, inside the rock, whether it's through uh, breaks or cracks, or um, whether it's just another rock on top of that's that's got space to take take oil and displace displace whatever water's in it and it moves into those rocks and so those rocks you know most of the time are sandstones or they're um like carbonate reefs that's a, another really common reservoir so that's another subsect of geology is looking at carbonates um so almost like the reefs that you would go you know dive dive in snorkel in that have coral and mm -hmm. um uh that are you know built up in certain areas of the world and those can actually host oil as well so those are conventionals. That's that's what we would do where you try to figure out where these rocks are. They're kind of in sparse areas because oil can only find, you know, certain certain places to go to and migrate to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the new world, the world that we've lived in since 2008 has been has been um, tackling what we call unconventionals. And those are um, essentially resource plays. And so what you're doing is you're actually you're actually tackling getting the oil from the rock that um, creates the oil. So the rock that creates the oil is this really tightly compacted rock that has a bunch of microorganisms in it. Mm -hmm. And so geologists, we try to map those out and we try to figure out where they are in the, in the subsurface. Cause we can't, mm -hmm. it's like you have a picture underground, right? right. You have to use um, these geophysical techniques which is a well log is geophysical technique, seismic is a geophysical technique, mm -hmm. and interpret that and figure out, okay, how, how deep is this? Where is it located? What is the, what is the rock like, right? You know, how mm -hmm. much oil does it have? Um, and so what we do with that is, is or so, so, let me, so let me go back to resource place. Okay. So um, those rocks are really compressed. Usually they're like fine grained and they're like really thin, small clay particles, like kind of stuff you'd see out of the Gulf of Mexico. And they've got a bunch of plankton in them. Plankton's the most common type of um, material that you use mm -hmm. for source rock. And um, those um, those rocks generate oil when they get heat. Those those organisms generate oil when they get heated up. So they get compressed and they get pressurized and pushed way down into the into the subsurface. And then as they heat up, they um, expel hydrocarbons. They expel oil first, and then eventually they'll start as they get hotter and and uh, that oil starts to actually break down, it'll turn into natural gas. So and that's why, so in resource plays, typically natural gas is in the deeper part of the basin mm -hmm. and oil is in the shallower part of the basin because it's just where it formed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's what we target in unconventionals is these, these plays. And they're, and they're called unconventional because um, you can't just drill a well into them and expect them to flow back. They're really tight and that's where the, the idea of around hydraulic fracturing came was mm -hmm. you had to pump water and sand into those really tight rocks, break them apart and create these synthetic pathways that we, that, you know, that we, that we uh, generate with that pressure mm -hmm. for the oil to flow through and come back to the, to the oil well. So, mm -hmm. so going back to seismic data, yeah, you guys use that to determine where you're going to drill a well? Yeah, it's, it's used for a few things. Um, one, yeah, locating where you are in the subsurface is really important. So you want to know how deep to drill, especially when you're when you're drilling down and then turning the well horizontally, mm -hmm. um, like we do in most unconventional resource plays. Mm -hmm. um, 
you want to be able to find that formation across one to two to three miles. Mm -hmm. And in order to build a a Ford model or to kind of build a, a, you know, an idea of where that is projected out, um, you've got to spend a lot of time, you know, understanding, okay, either you got to map a bunch of wells and kind of interpolate between them, Mm -hmm. or you need to uh, have seismic data, which um, basically uses sound waves. You can, we take like a big truck called a Viper size or drill holes and put sticks of dynamite in them and, Mm -hmm. and set them off. And there's a bunch of microphones on the surface that then listen to those waves as they travel down, reflect off the rocks and come back. Mm -hmm. And so through some computer processing, you can figure out, okay, how, how far down are these different reflections and build a picture. And so Mm -hmm. the pictures, it's a relative picture, right? It's like, um, if you were to, um, if, if you were to use an ultrasound, but you didn't know what was, what was there, right. Um, you need like a doctor to figure out, okay, this, this is the, you know, like for a baby, I've got three kids, so I've, I've seen mm-hmm. lots of ultrasounds. <laughs> um, you've got, you know, this is the, this is the baby, this is their arm, this is their legs, this is their head, you know, like you, unless you've seen it a lot, um, that's kind of what a geophysicist is like, you know, mm-hmm. looking at seismic data. Mm-hmm. We can, you know, we have tools and we've been trained to look at the data to map it, interpret it and, and understand, okay, this is where the rock formation is. This is where the well ties into mm-hmm. in, in this, in this image. And, and then we use that to plan wells, figure out where we need to drill them. And then the, the, the properties of the, of the, uh, of the image. So like the amplitude, the, um, the amount of energy that comes back also tells you a lot about the rock itself. So you can determine like what kind of rock it is, um, how, how much, um, oil or gas is contained in the rock. Um, uh, what else? I mean, that's the main thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look at the rock properties. Mm-hmm. Um, so mapping those out uh, in a really dense way is is what seismic is a really powerful tool for. And of course, you're spending millions of dollars to drill I was, well. That was so. going to be my next question. Like, <laughs> is that it's obviously an expensive process. So does it ever happen like when you go do this process and there's it, you like picked the wrong location? Yeah. I mean, that, that's a very you've expensive already mistake. S- yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was my. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why seismic is so important because um, it it affords you the ability to not make that mistake, right? You might you might get seismic over an area and spend you know tens of millions of dollars, but if you're going to drill you know dozens of wells, yeah, then you'll make it back immediately because each well might cost you know ten million dollars to drill and complete it. And um, so, how long has seismic data like been? Is it like a fairly new concept? Like what did what did they do before? Yeah, so seismic has been around um, for a long time. Um, I mean, the first seismic recording was done in Oklahoma. Um, I don't remember the year, maybe somewhere in the 1920s, 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has uh, been an integral technology, mm-hmm. especially for conventional exploration. In conventional fields, you can't just map a resource and say, well, we can drill pretty much anywhere here, like a like we do in our conventional, you can drill anywhere in this this whole area and make a, make a well. Mm-hmm. That's where the concept of you've heard dry holes come from. Yeah, mm-hmm. in conventional wells, you can literally drill a, a well that will make nothing. It might make water. It might make maybe a little bit of gas. It can make literally nothing. And so there's a huge risk to uh, drilling those wells. And seismic is super super important for those mm-hmm. conventional wells. Not only for mm-hmm. the depth, but figuring out okay, is there actually even oil here where i think there is or gas here where i think there is Mm -hmm. and so seismic will tell you that directly we use what are called direct hydrocarbon indicators to figure out if there Mm -hmm. are there are actually um fields that you can drill and um and so it's it's super important for that because it can it can be it can be the difference between making a completely dry hole or Mm -hmm. making an economic well Mm -hmm. right so it's like more efficient to do it yeah. Way. Yeah. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it, people rag on the cost, but um, again, when you put it against drilling and completing wells, it's, it's minimal uh, mm-hmm. for de-risking for people who are actually going to put the money into operating. Um, it's a very important process that I think everybody should be doing. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think one of the timely things about this podcast and about, you know, image right now is that mm-hmm. what, Geophysics and geology are on the decline coming out of universities. Um, graduates, mm-hmm. there's, there's just 
it's abysmal. I mean, there's very few graduates. I know the same thing's happening at petroleum engineering, mm -hmm. but it's been like that in geology and geophysics since 2014, just been the steady decline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to touch on what the IMAGE conference is? Yeah, sure. So so IMAGE um, was, <laughs> unfortunately, I think, created partially out of the decline of, of geology and geophysics in the industry and the number of, of geophysicists because um, we used to have separate conferences for mm -hmm. geologists and geophysicists. So the geology side is AEPG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and then SEG, the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And so they combine their annual conferences into one, which I like a lot better, and yeah. we get a lot more cross-pollination and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's basically a technical conference where mm -hmm. you can go and see talks and visit with vendors and um, just network with each other, other fellow geoscientists. They're targeting students that are coming out of Absolutely. College. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great place for students to go. Um, it's a great place to go get a job, bring a resume. You know, if you're going to go to to Image, definitely bring a resume or mm -hmm. bring a print off some cards. It doesn't cost very much to yeah make some cards on Canva. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's exactly. it's actually sure. a good thing. I've had I've had lots of students give me cards before. I uh, made some good relationships from that. You know, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I, I know or myself like when I think about oil and gas, I never think about geology. So. Right, right. I think, yeah, well, this that's is sad. good. We need to fix that. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the rocks is where it, that's that's right, where it's it where starts. It all starts. That's where it starts. <laughs> that's where it ends. You know, uh, I mean, yeah. that's 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 everything. Um, you have to know, uh, you know, where the rocks are, where the 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 we talk about the the breaks in the ground, which I haven't really discussed yet. There's all these subsurface hazards mm -hmm. like faults. You are familiar with like what a fault looks like. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, these faults are deep down in the ground and there's these big displacements in in the formations and you need seismic to see them and you need to be able to map them, you know, to, to drill wells. And then you need to understand them for um, like the natural permeability around mm -hmm. some of these unconventional plays. So they, there's all these natural fractures in the rock that we try to try to target. And yeah, it's just, it's so important to have um, good geoscientists mm -hmm. on your team that mm -hmm. are working with right. you, helping you understand the subsurface. Yeah. So when you guys are looking for the potential of a site using seismic data, like how how long does it take? Is it coming at you in real time or? No, that's, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, you know, a lot of the resource plays, for instance, uh, the unconventional plays, have already had seismic acquired over them. So it, it's a long, it's a fairly long process to go and acquire seismic over a large area. I mean, it can take, you know, one, two years to, to acquire it and process it and all that for a big area. Mm -hmm. um, for smaller areas, the turnaround time's gotten a lot faster with, with bigger, faster computers now. Mm -hmm. um, but generally you already have the data acquired. And what mm -hmm. you do is you go through and, and interpret kind of regionally, uh, at least as a geophysicist, and you integrate it with you with with geology and with with well logs um you know that are just just the same thing it's just geophysical measurements in the borehole and you put all that together usually ahead of time and then you refine refine it over time as you drill wells as you collect more information it's just a constant refinement process because it's not like you get an answer when you get your seismic data you have to have somebody constantly looking at it and integrating it with new well data and mm -hmm. understanding like oh well this was you know a bad interpretation or maybe i need to change my understanding um, because it's not like you get the answer right away. You have to right. you have to interpret it and figure it out. Um, it's a relative process that's constantly evolving. Even for people who've been in the industry for many years, it's not like I can just look at a seismic section and be like, oh, well, this is what you have to do. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> um, it does take you know it does take somebody there on the team you know constantly working with you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I know we talked about this before we started the podcast. Yeah. Do you want to explain to us what's going on here? I thought this was really cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. so these come out of, uh, these are some oil samples. I don't know if the, oh, it's picking it up, the camera's that. picking it up it or not. Yeah. Oh, there you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are some oil samples out of uh, my favorite warm. basin and most, um, I would say most geologists who have worked this basin, it ends up being their their favorite basin. It's called the Uinta Basin. It's in uh, central Utah. And when I was at Newfield, um, I had the, uh, the pleasure of, a, of, a, of getting some of these uh, oil samples. These are these are actually oil samples. They are solid at room temperature because of mm -hmm. the paraffins and asphaltines in the in in the oil. And when you, <laughs> it's got a smell to it, um, 
when you when you actually transport them, you have to transport them in heated trucks. That's got to mm-hmm. be over 165 degrees to keep them molten and moving, um, in heated pipelines. And so it's it's a it's a really neat. This is a really complex, um, very challenging basin. So that's why a lot of geologists like it. And it's it's kind of it's kind of a small area, but um, not a lot of operators in it. But it makes some really cool oil. So as you go from a shallower section up through. It's a thing on my camera. Yeah, they up can through see. the um, up uh, through the deeper section, this, as you get deeper, it gets more yellow. Um, it has more paraffins, less asphalt, asphalt teens, and so it's a it's a neat it's a neat you know sample collection that you can put in 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 jam jars and and kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, really cool. kind of put on your desk and hang out. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to look at it more, but it's a uh, it's when you contrast it with where I, where I was when I was at Ensign. This is from South Texas, and you can see it's it's what we call high API gravity condensate, and it's um, very light. I mean, it's just it just looks like like Gatorade. Is that <laughs> also, oh, that has a bad smell. I don't I don't actually know what it smells like. I don't want to open it because I'm afraid that yeah. the VOCs are gonna like invade my nose and <laughs> I'm not gonna, gonna like, like it. Drop dead or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, and so this this was this was also this was collected in South Texas. This is actually from the the Austin Chalk. But it has a very similar, the Eagle Fort oil would look the same. But you can see, I mean, it's very, it's very light. Yeah. Um, it's Watery. very high API gravity, which is like a, you know, non-viscous. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it's just neat to contrast the two. You know, this is, this is super viscous and this is, you know, really light. And that's, that's reality with uh, oil basins. And a lot of this is determined by the types of, um, the types of microbes and the, the types of um, organisms that create the oil. Um, they can create byproducts that make it solid, or they can just make really clean, um, you know, really clean and, and light oil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you say there's like more of the of the light oil in Texas, or? Yeah. Um, so the the oil in the Permian is, uh, I would say, the oil in the, the Eagle Fur is is mostly light crude. Um, you have some we call black oil a little bit up dip that's you know that's a little more viscous but um yeah in, in texas so you've got the eagleford the barnett which is up in the fort worth basin mm-hmm. uh, and then the permian which has got you know wolf camp bone springs avalon um those those formations and i i'm not a permian expert but i believe those are lighter crudes especially compared to stuff like this mm-hmm. um you know this this type of oil you might see um you know there's some canadian crews like the, the oil oil sands is, is even lower api gravity than this so it's basically just a, a a puddle that they have to or not a puddle but like a a slush that they have to put steam in to actually mobilize it and move mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. and that's what they call the, the tar sands even though it's a bit of a, a misnomer um and so they're i mean and around the world there you know are a lot of heavy oils like this Really interesting. And then he also brought really cool rocks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> These are some some gifts that I had been given over the years that are um pretty neat. You have an ammonite and uh just a, a bivalve, which, you know, for most people who've had oysters, they've seen that. So this is this is what it looks like when it comes out of the ground? Yeah, so these are... When, like, when, is this a dumb question? No, no. <laughs> I mean, no, it's a good question. They're, this doesn't come like this. I mean, this is like polished and right, cleaned and right. all that. But mm-hmm. but yeah, you might imagine it being really dirty and a bunch of bunch of other host rock around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are um, these are cleaned up and polished and look really pretty. But um, this is what they look like. What what happens is all the organic material that that is contained in uh, in these when they're buried is replaced by something else. And so that's what how they're fossilized is that they're basically filled in. Like this one's got a bunch of this ammonite's got a bunch of little, little quartz, you know, gross mm-hmm. on the inside of it, almost like a geode. And um, even like this trilobite, this little trilobite sample, it's got um, it's essentially been replaced with something else that mm-hmm. that goes in and 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 fills it. And so, you know, in general, for oil and gas, um, fossils are are used to figure out okay what what time period are these from. So there's a lot of fossils that are right. from certain time periods, and those will actually tell you, okay, if I, if I look at a rock over here and I look at a rock, you know, 100 miles away, um, are they the same rock? Like maybe they they have same properties, but it might might be created at totally different times, and so um, that can be really important for understanding 
when was this rock deposited? Is mm-hmm. it is it is it correlated to a time where you know there's a lot of oil created? Um, and so that's you know you don't look at fossils like this, but you I mean, you might look at uh, you know smaller um, called biomarkers mm-hmm. in in the rock um, that are more measured in the lab, not necessarily like or measured in core, so we can actually go in and take out uh, from the borehole, actually go around and cut a whole piece of rock and pull it out of the section. And that's another, you know, a uh, great way of identifying what's in your, what's in the rock that you're trying to, uh, trying to explore in. Hmm. And then we, we usually pull out like a cylinder of it and cut it in half and then polish it and look at it, um, you know, in, in a lab and, you know, measure different boundaries and, you know, look for, look for small microorganisms that are in there and, and markers and, um, it's a really, and do a lot of tests on it. And so it's a really useful way of understanding of like actually tying into the physical rock that's, uh, thousands of feet down into the ground. Yeah. So that's is so that, cool. is that like what your day to day looks like as a geophysicist? Like, are you behind a computer? Are you computer all day? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I mean, I would say for, for most people in upstream oil and gas, mm-hmm. that's what you're doing. Um, behind a computer, um, there's a lot of opportunity to go out and see outcrops. And I don't know if you guys are from, familiar with outcrops, but basically, mm-hmm. you know, rock over time as it's deposited um, is shifted and moved from plate tectonics. So as the plates collide, move around, the earth kind of shifts, um, the formations bend and, 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 and move and or get, you get kind of put on a slope. And so those slopes eventually can get eroded down and exposed at the surface. Um, and so those exposures allow us to kind of see a picture of what, what the rock is, you know, way deep down, uh, underneath us. If we just kind of project it down, like, oh, this is the same rock, you know, over here in in South Texas, it's, you know, it's, uh, it might be two miles into the ground, but over here we can actually see it on the surface because it's dipping way up and Mm -hmm. and finally exposed. And so, um, those outcrops are common field trip that we'll do in oil and gas. We'll go look at the Woodford or go look at the Austin Chalk or the Eagleford. We can't really look at the Eagleford because it's because it's a shale. It's basically just eroded so horribly. It doesn't, mm-hmm. doesn't preserve well at the surface. Um, but you, there's spots where you can look at um, lots of rocks on surface and outcrop and understand them a little better. Yeah. And uh, get, get you know, hand samples and pictures and look at organisms that are contained in it. And um, that's, a, that's, that's one field opportunity you would do as a geologist. So um, it, I guess it just depends if gas. you're like upstream, midstream, downstream. Yeah, I mean, so, we're all pretty much upstream. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're basically all on the planning and execution side. Mm-hmm. And and then everything, once the oil is out of the ground, you know, geologists and geophysicists don't really have a hand in that. Um, so especially as a geophysicist, you're really, you know, the only other time, the only time you're in the field is when you're acquiring seismic data or acquiring. Mm-hmm. There's other types of geophysics too besides seismic. I've really only talked about that because that's the primary thing that we use. But you can use electromagnetic waves you can use uh, uh, uh electromagnetic fields um you can use gra- measurements of of um changes in density which we measure by looking at gravitational changes mm-hmm. across the earth magnetic fields um and those are more commonly used in, in other industries like mining and um in, in in academia where you're just trying to map things on the surface mm-hmm. um but because seismic is the highest resolution geophysical um measurement that you can you can do for uh, for the subsurface that's that's why we use it mostly and and talking about like technological advances is is there something that could put out even uh, like more accurate or faster data than seismic that has uh i think the physics kind of limited you know because mm-hmm. um sound waves are the thing that best travel down into into the, into the subsurface it's all very compressed you know as, as everything's buried it gets really compressed so sound waves are the things that fastest that mm-hmm. travel the fastest and the furthest into the ground and i think what we can do is just get better at, at better processing at it, it. Yeah. yeah so and that's really what's changed over the past 20 years has been just this rapid advancement in not only compute power but algorithm algorithms and and of course things like machine learning that become more available and mm-hmm. full waveform inversion which is a whole you know subset of, of seismic geophysics it's just like this really advanced way of looking at rock properties while you're processing them essentially and um and using the entire wave field mm-hmm. um because you know just there's different kinds of waves and and there's different ways that you can 
process the data. Um, so you have waves that are like compressional waves. It's mm -hmm. like ways that you, compressional waves are basically sound waves, like waves that you hear in in the air. So if I'm talking, you're hearing compressional waves come into your ear. That's what's what your ear bones are are vibrating, um, hearing. And then you have shear waves, um, which if you think about how like a slinky might move, if you hold it from end to end and kind of shake mm -hmm. it, shear mm -hmm. waves kind of move up and down like this, and they can move in different polarizing waves. And um, those can also be can also be measured. They don't travel as deep, um, but we do use those for for certain types of uh, processing. Um, and then there, of course, there's like surface waves, which is like what you see from an earthquake. Those are the waves that damage things. They kind of move yeah. side to side and do these really horribly damaging motions on the surface um, that that are called it's called called ground roll when we were measuring it in seismic. But um, those types of waves are the kind of things that knock buildings down and, and things like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And so um, whenever you're shooting seismic, you don't make much of those waves. Like you just kind of feel it, you know, shake the ground a little bit. Yeah. Um, but when you have an earthquake, that's what, you know, causes those, mm -hmm. uh, those types of waves. Right. So, so, so mostly, you know, capturing more wave information, um, better, faster processing, better algorithms, better computer techniques. Those are, those are the things that we kind of advance in um, and what has really changed the industry a lot. Wow. This is a little bit off topic, but I'm just curious. It's okay. Um, is there, like, when an earthquake happens, mm -hmm. you can't predict that? Uh, or not can't. really. Well, no, not really. I mean, it. you can find, you, there are a lot of areas that are prone to earthquakes. Right. So where plates collide, you know, where, where continental plates collide, that obviously a place where uh, there's going to be a lot of mm -hmm. noise from the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and there are just a number of known areas that we've measured seismicity over mm -hmm. the years that just like generally California. produce it from, yeah, like California. That's, that's plates sliding next to each other like this, translational plates. Um, there's areas where there's a lot of natural subsidence, so a lot of the there's there's room in the subsurface for things to kind of collapse, and over time that that can cause uh, mm -hmm. earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're having rocks shifting against each other, that's that's causing an earthquake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're not really easy to predict necessarily. Um, yeah, because I guess they just happen on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the really big ones, usually there's some um, there's some kind of leading smaller earthquakes ahead of time, mm -hmm. and if you know it's an area, then that's where there can be some monitoring systems that can send out alarms and alerts and things like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, usually if you live next to where earthquakes are going to happen, there's You're not just, much you can do about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a kind of stupid question. So <laughs> since the earth is like constantly evolving, mm -hmm. if you use any of these techniques to, you know, process data, mm -hmm. say the first time you did it 20 years ago, there, there's no potential. Yeah. And then, you know, present day, 20 years later, is there a chance that the site has completely like evolved into something else? And now that there's like unlimited potential in that area? Well, there's, that's a great, that's actually yeah. a great question really because there's, there's two parts of that. One, you could have improved your data acquisition quality a lot over 20 years, right? So you might've shot a really crappy survey. Maybe you only shot like really wide, you only use like really wide sources and crappier microphones and, and more maybe your processing techniques weren't as good. So reprocessing or reacquiring data over that same area could yield things that you didn't mm -hmm. see there before. Um, mm -hmm. You just didn't have the resolution. Um, it's like, again, like I go back to ultrasounds because, you know, a lot of people understand that that um, analogy. You know, when I was when I was when my mom got an ultrasound of me, she could, they couldn't really see much like they could barely make bake out the image. Right. Mm -hmm. But then. 20 years later with the same technology, we're building 3D models of babies, right, in the yeah. womb, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's a totally different, you know, the technology has shifted so much, even though you're measuring the same thing, mm -hmm. it's shifted a lot. So technology changes is a big deal. But there's actually a really interesting, um, another really interesting piece to that, to that question is that the subsurface can change. So most of the time, geologic time happens over millions of years. I mean, we're looking at things that happened hundreds of millions of years ago and that's the the time scales are just mind blowing when you think about say, that that's scale. Crazy, mm -hmm. it's crazy to think about. It's very hard to imagine. It's very hard to to kind of put in perspective. But when we think about the scale at which humans change things, it's very rapid. So when we pull oil out of a reservoir, and let's say it's a conventional reservoir that's got a lot of space, and what happens when you evacuate that space? it starts to shrink because the oil is holding it up, right? Mm -hmm. So you get subsidence, you get changes in the rock, in the over in the rock above it, which is called the overburden. And you kind of get these 
features that collapse. So what a lot of companies do, especially in offshore, is they go back and shoot over the same area and then they measure the effects of those changes. It's called 4D seismic. Mm -hmm. So they measure the effects of those changes and that's becoming really popular now for, for a number of reasons. One, because you understand, you want to understand what's left, right? You want to understand mm -hmm. what's, what's changed, what's, what's still there. And two, we're talking about going and injecting CO2 back into the earth. So you want to see how it's changed and see, you know, okay, well, this is, if this, this is really depleted, you know, is there, do we think that there's space to come back in and, and inject uh, mm -hmm. another fluid back into the ground in the same spot? Um, so that's actually, it's, it's a very relevant question. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I would have never thought. <laughs> I, I, I always, I don't know what I have in mind for like, sites and oil rigs and all that stuff i actually didn't even know oil looked like that i don't know what i thought that's why i brought it i don't know if so it was like olive oil in my mind yeah. or something right. but like i just i i think i just always had this idea that like once you look at a site if there's nothing there you just move on to the next and that's why mm -hmm. you know there's all these myths and rumors about like how we're running out but when you think about like evolution and yeah. just how things are constantly changing mm -hmm. i i guess i just never but two and two together. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of potential to go back and, you know, look at other formations and look at, you know, other areas that we didn't mm -hmm. have the technology to look in before. So absolutely. And areas that have opened up because of regulatory reasons, you know, silly things like that. I mean, um, if you look off the coast of Florida, for instance, I mean, it's basically an untouched, you, you, I mean, you guys know there's there's one of the most, the most prolific area in the United States is the Gulf of Mexico, right, mm -hmm. for, for oil and gas. And Florida is a virtually untouched area. And, and you know, for, for a lot of reasons, right, people don't want oil rigs in the background. They don't want potential for spills mm -hmm. on the beaches and things like that. Right. Um, but there's a lot of, there's there's tons of oil out there. So there's a lot of areas that are just untouched, untouched. for those reasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe with future technology and, and future safety protocols and, and ways to extract it um, without having, you know, risk of, of spills, that those areas will unlock. And, and it's going to be really important to have geoscientists to characterize those areas and to tell you where to go where to drill and how to understand you know where this uh, where this rock is located mm -hmm. and what it looks like mm -hmm. so is that like the florida the state regulates that like you can't touch yeah it's a it's a well i think i'm not sure if there's federal regulations around it but i definitely know the state doesn't yeah. doesn't want you to you know go drill around mm -hmm. yeah around their their offshore areas mm -hmm. interesting but i've seen seismic over there i'm like oh yeah there's you know Oil there. There's, there's stuff there. <laughs> and it's like it's like an invisible line, you know, once yeah. you cross that line, you can't do anything. But I've seen some seismic that goes over the area. And same with the East Coast. I mean, the East Coast, um, you know, we thought it was going to open up for, for drilling uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. And um, and there's been some kind of, you know, back and forth about regulations. But but a number of companies went in and shot a bunch of seismic over over the area. And of mm -hmm. course, there's, there's tons of potential. Mm -hmm. um in the atlantic margin so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so cool that is do you guys want to move into rapid fire do you want to take it. rapid fire sure all right andrew <laughs> <laughs> in, your spot opinion, here. <laughs> in your opinion what is the biggest misconception of um hold on let me redo that it's okay uh what is the biggest misconception in the energy industry oh in the energy that we all hate the environment <laughs> because, in, in fact, I think you'll find more a higher concentration of environmentalists in a mm -hmm. single industry than you will anywhere else. Because we all love industry, especially on the geoscience side. Like, we're all nature lovers, love getting out. We don't want to see our home and our world polluted. Right. I mean, I've always felt like I was an environmentalist growing up. I was in Boy Scouts. I was just very conscious of that. And so it pains me to see people like, oh, you hate you hate the environment. You hate the world. Like, it just it drives me nuts. So mm -hmm. that's something that I really wish we could do a better job at, you know, explaining to people. Yeah, that's why we started this podcast to educate them because they just don't know, you know. Yeah. Um, why should we care about energy? Well, energy, uh, one, it, it's tied directly to, um, it's tied directly to, um, <laughs> sorry, it's like spacing out. You're good. <laughs> um, it, it's tied directly to uh, wealth and prosperity. I mean, mm -hmm. energy, Energy is required for prosperity. Right. So we have to have energy to be a developed nation. And other nations need energy to be developed nations. And it doesn't really matter how we get that energy. Um, but it's just, it's, it's inherent. I mean, it's, it's, it's required in our society. And if we can 
you know, bring energy to, to people and lift, you know, the world out of poverty, you know, who knows what type of technological advancements and, um, you know, what types of things we'll see coming out of these other places where people are, you know, living hand, you know, hand to mouth and can't, um, can't escape, you know, poverty and can't escape their, um, their situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'd have a much better, much cleaner, much safer world if we had more abundant energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Um, in your career, what is your most embarrassing story? Oh God. (laughs) I don't know if I should talk about that on a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) A embarrassing story. A embarrassing story. And <laughs> uh, man, do you have a lot of them? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's so hard to choose because I've had so many slip ups. I would say, you know, I would say one thing that I have, a, I have a very, um, I've always had a very strong personality, mm-hmm. and when I came into oil and gas, um, which is is dominated by like a lot of legacy right there's a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of really you know really smart really established uh people in, in in the in the industry i think that i thought i knew a lot more than i did and i was thinking like oh i'm gonna you know i'm gonna you know i'm gonna push my way through this and i'm gonna be uh you know gung-ho about everything and be the best in no time and it's kind of that like to, that a lot of software companies you know kind of train software people to, to think that way Mm-hmm. And uh, I quickly realized um, through a number of embarrassing situations, which I won't detail, but it's just it's good to know for people who are starting out there. Um, listen as much as you can and uh, take on as many mentors as you can who will keep you reined in, especially if you're very ambitious, mm-hmm. um, because those mentors know a lot more than you do and mm-hmm. will teach you a lot and um, walk in with open eyes and open ears. And I think, you know, you have a very successful career because I made those mistakes early on and I have fortunately had some really great mentors who kind of picked me up and said, no, no, stop that. Like, <laughs> they, will hum- they will humble you. Yeah, yeah. They will humble you very fast. I had a fantastic mentor. I'll mention him here. Hopefully he listens. Doug Cook, who would always humble me. Um, and we're very good friends uh, now. And um, he's retired now, but he would, he had no problem from the very beginning, from my very first internship, humbling me and putting me in my place. And, and not that everybody needs that, mm-hmm. but, it's just good to know that, you know, there's a lot to learn and yeah. there's a lot to absorb. And, and you will always, that's one of the fun things about this, this industry is you will always be learning. So try not to be too overconfident and try not to, uh, you know, overstep your bounds too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Andrew. This has been awesome. Um, our team will actually be at the image conference on August 30th. Um, at the gathering place mm-hmm. so you can find us there where can we find you oh yes for our listeners uh, like are, are you on linkedin, LinkedIn or yeah i'm on um, i'm on linkedin. LinkedIn. linkedin's the easiest way to get to me um and then you know i'm at most conferences so you can just walk up and talk to me whenever you want yeah so. you'll be at the image conference i'll be at image yep mm-hmm. awesome and we'll, we're sponsoring Andrew. a booth at fuse so we'll be at fuse yeah. oh, oh awesome. amazing we actually just had you guys present over at energy tech night in oklahoma yes. city too um, we did yep. yeah zach was awesome he actually talked really highly of you that's nice i'm um, getting you out here so we're super excited to have you yeah, yeah i was really sad i missed that but i was in hawaii so i can't be too sad uh-huh. <laughs> are you based in houston Yes, I okay. uh, live down the street. Yep. Oh, cool. Very cool. Oh, we'll see. Uh, come see us at Image Conference in Houston. It's at the George R. Brown. Mm-hmm. At George R. Brown. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks.